Friday was lunch at the Walnut Bar. This is where the Idiot Club meets once a week to share their troubles. The membership is not very impressive, just four middle-aged guys with one thing in common. Our wives cheat on us. Bradley Cook, Ray Timmons, Carl Marshall and me, John Terrell, went to high school together. We all married our high school sweethearts and have remained friends all these 20 years. We have six children, two of whom are mine. All of them are either in high school or college. The four of us had no employment problems because we had something to feed the kids and pay the bills. The wives, on the other hand, were in a different situation. As the kids got older, the women had a lot of free time. They spent it together, shopping and going on various day trips. For the guys, it was all about lunch on Fridays, with occasional barbecues or parties at one of the houses on weekends. Carl was the first to notice that something was wrong. At first, he thought it was just his wife, Betsy. Then one day he brought it up in conversation and it opened the floodgates. None of us had anything definitive to indicate that our wives were being unfaithful, but we all noticed little things that indicated something was going on. Bradley printed out a list of things husbands should look for if they suspected their spouses were cheating. After studying the lists, everyone became paranoid. Weekly conversations over lunch turned into a retelling of our wives' actions over the past week. Soon we began to feel like we were fabricating everything just to fulfill some catastrophic prophecy we were projecting onto ourselves. None of us had the courage to confront our spouses. We had been married too long to risk pushing them away if we proved wrong. Besides, we were afraid of how an unjust accusation would affect the children. The biggest fear was that the suspicions might turn out to be true. Ray had a friend who had a friend who worked for a private detective agency. We paid $4,000 up front for one week's work. We all contributed our share and gave the guy pictures, phone numbers, license plates, and types of cars. He was going to start work the following Monday and give us a report at the next Friday meeting. It was going to be a long week. All of the girls were in their 40s, but not all of them yet. They all looked good for their age. Ray and his wife Jenny had one son who was in college. He had an accident while they were still in high school. Jenny was short, a little over five feet tall. She was also a bit of a hippie, but dressed well to hide it. She dyed her hair a blonde color and wore it up to appear taller. But it didn't work. Jenny had the best personality of all. She could always make you laugh. Bradley ended up marrying a feisty Italian woman named Carla. Carla had a body any man would die for. Her hair was dark, almost black, but not quite. It went well with her olive complexion. She never stopped talking. They had a daughter who was very much like her mother. My wife, Marcy, seemed to be the leader of the pack. Marcy was not as tall as Betsy, but almost the same. She had natural blonde hair that she wore down to her shoulders. I always thought she was beautiful, but she had a few acne scars from her teenage years that she had to hide with makeup. She was self-conscious about them, and I tried to never mention it. I wasn't the most beautiful guy in the world, but I felt happy just being around her. By Thursday night, I was a mess. Marcy was in a good mood, and we had a great dinner that night. My sons, Josh and Jordan, had already left the house at 6 o'clock for an unknown destination. They had good grades and never got into trouble, so I didn't want to know what they were doing. Marcy and I spent the evening alone in front of the television. It was our usual pastime. I began to think that was probably the problem. I wasn't giving her enough entertainment and thrills. Of course, at that point, I didn't even realize I actually had a problem. Tomorrow I would find out the news, good or bad. I wanted to talk to her about it, but I didn't know how to start the conversation. I sat like that, deep in thought, for most of the evening. Shortly after Marcy went to bed, the boys came home. We chatted for a few minutes about nothing in particular, and then they went to bed too. I, on the other hand, grabbed a beer and stayed up watching old comedy shows until I fell asleep on the couch. When I woke up in the morning, the TV was still on. The boys were just getting ready for school. John, what's wrong? You seem out of sorts for the last week or so. Something going on at work? Marcy seemed to hover over him. No, there's nothing wrong at work, honey. I just have a lot of other things on my mind. Is there anything I can do to help? Is there anything I can do? I rose slowly from the soft couch and walked up the stairs. I'm afraid it's too late now. What has been done can no longer be undone. I left her with this deeply philosophical maxim and headed for the shower myself. Thirty minutes later, I was on my way out the door. Marcy had made coffee and a light breakfast, but I walked past her without saying anything. She looked worried, and she should be. The rest of the morning seemed to drag on. 
It seemed to me that lunchtime would never come. Carl, Bradley, and Ray were already sitting at the table when I arrived. I thought I was going to get there early, but they all beat me to it. We decided not to order food, but we each had a draft. Frank Perella was the secret agent assigned to our case. It was a feeble attempt on our part to inject some levity into what would otherwise be a grim undertaking. Now, gentlemen, I have here reports for four different days, and each one deals with a different wife. Does anyone want to speak first, or should I do it one day at a time? After we all agreed that we should do the stories by day, Frank started with Mondays. To start, each of your wives meets with someone. For the first four days, we were just gathering information on when and where. We don't have any serious photo or audio evidence because that would cost you a lot more money and take longer. He paused for a moment, apparently for empty effect. It's interesting that only one wife can have an affair in one day. The other three were her cover. They'd all go out for the day together and all come back together. If they went shopping, the three who weren't dating anyone would buy something for the one who was dating. I can only assume that if there was a problem, they would cover for each other. Any questions yet? There were no questions, so he continued. On Monday, they all left together in Marcy's car. It was the easiest tale of the week. At 10 o'clock, they dropped Carla Cook off at 321 David Drive and then went to the Berkshire Mall. I walked back to the house on David Drive and waited to see what would happen next. The house is rented by a guy named Steve Springer. He works as a bodybuilder at Henderson Ford in Terrytown. We later found out that 10 minutes before Carla was dropped off, a cell phone call was made to the house. The same phone was used during all the other appointments. It's an unregistered cell phone, but we have the number. We don't know which of the women owns that phone. Bradley didn't look his best. He had a temper, and it looked like he was having a hard time controlling it right now. Ray said something quietly to him, and he calmed down a little. About three hours later, a call was made from the home phone to the cell phone. Ten minutes after that, Marcy and the girls drove by and picked up Carla. She drove each of them to their respective homes. That's it for Monday. Any questions? Bradley was already on edge. Can I get a beer? We ended up ordering five beers. Frank drank half of his beer and continued. Tuesday was Carla's turn to drive. They all drove to Renninger's Antique Market, about ten miles out of town. After parking the car, they kept together as they entered the market grounds. It was hard to keep track of them in the crowded aisles, but it didn't take long. About ten minutes before they arrived, a cell phone call went off. The call was to the Dorchester Motel across the highway from the market. Betsy Marshall separated from the group and walked out the front door. I followed her and watched as she crossed the road and entered room 114 of the Dorchester Motel. Richard Tolliver had booked this room the day before. Mrs. Marshall stayed in the room for over two hours and then returned to the market where she met the other women at the same place where she had left them. They left the market and went home. Any questions? I couldn't help myself. Carl, who the hell is Richard Tolliver? He's our optometrist. I thought she's been getting her eyes checked a lot lately. Carl slumped back in his chair, finishing his beer. There wasn't a single smiling face at the table. We decided to order another mug of beer each. On Wednesday, Betsy got behind the wheel. They drove to the Green Dragon Farmer's Market. The cell phone call that day went to a different phone, but it was traceable. Instead of parking as close to the market as possible, they went to the far end of the parking lot where the motorhomes were parked. The four of them walked across the parking lot, but only three of them actually entered the market area. I had to go back and try to find out what happened to Jenny Timmons. She was nowhere to be found. I wrote down the license plates of all the cars she could have gotten away in, 23 of them. My men were able to match the cell phone number that had been called and the numbers of the motorhomes. An hour later, I was standing in front of a large Winnebago owned by Owen Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer owns a Volvo dealership in Lancaster. Shortly after noon, Jenny left the motorhome and joined the other ladies for lunch. Later, they were all laughing and joking as they walked back to the car to drive home. Ray, you drive a Volvo, don't you? Yes. We bought it in Lancaster last year. I wanted to do something nice for Jenny. It's a joke, but it's best none of you laugh. I waited with dread for what would happen next. I was the only one left. I definitely didn't want more beer. Okay, Frank. I can't stand the suspension. What the hell happened on Thursday? On Thursday, Jenny drove the Volvo to the King of Prussia Mall. 
They walked into the mall acting very casual. Marcy made a cell phone call and handed the receiver to Jenny. The executive suites adjoined the mall on the north side. The group headed that way, and then Marcy Terrell slipped away and entered the elevator. All we knew at that point was that she went up to the fifth floor. It took a few hours, but my people were able to cross-check the cell phone call against the license plate registration. State Assemblyman Alan Hoffman had rented room 511 for the day for a business conference. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, a call was made from that room to our mystery cell phone. Ten minutes later, all the ladies were back together and headed home. This concludes my review. We will prepare detailed reports for each of you. If you decide you need more information, we will be happy to help you. Suddenly, I smiled to myself. Carl noticed it and just had to ask, What's so funny? Alan Hoffman is a Democrat. And Marcy and I are Republicans. I just thought it was funny. The rest of the guys didn't get the joke. Frank gathered up all his papers. He had short, abbreviated reports for each of us. They were almost like a draft, but they had all the important stuff in them. We all thanked him as he left. Now we were alone in our misery. No one wanted to drink any more beer. Ray and Carl had already taken the whole day off. Bradley and I soon followed suit. When I got home, Marcy's car was gone. Today was her day to go grocery shopping. At least she was doing it alone. The boys were still at school. Taking advantage of the empty house and free time, I moved my clothes and personal belongings into the guest room. I came downstairs just in time to help Marcy unload groceries from the car. She didn't ask what I was doing home so early. She still had the look of concern on her face that had appeared when I left that morning. I tried not to disturb her while she was busy putting the groceries away. She knew where everything was and I didn't. Soon she was cooking dinner. She was a good cook and homemaker. Just as the boys came home from school, the phone rang. I greeted the boys as usual while Marcy chatted. She hung up with a concerned look on her face. The boys went off to their rooms. What the hell were you doing this afternoon? I'm not sure I know what you're talking about. That was Jenny on the phone. Bradley came home early from work today and started accusing Carla of cheating on him. It ended in a fight, and Carla is in the hospital now. The police are talking to Bradley. Jenny called Carla's parents. Jenny said it all happened because of some meeting you had today. John, what's going on? Why aren't you telling me? This isn't the time to be nice, damn it. I want an explanation? I pulled my cell phone out of my pocket and hit the new speed dial number I had downloaded earlier. I watched the blood rush from Marcy's face as the prepaid phone hidden in her purse began to ring. I wasn't sure if she had the phone, but I decided to take my chances. Aren't you going to answer it? It could be important. A short pause followed. Oh my God. You know, don't you? I know everything. We all know everything. About that time, Josh and Jordan came down the stairs for dinner. You're not going to say anything in front of the boys, are you? I won't if you say yes. Tell them everything and I'll keep my mouth shut. If you lie or try to embellish, I'll be forced to tell them everything myself. You won't like that. We started the meal as usual. I didn't feel it was necessary for Marcy to tell me everything right away. It would be nice to finish the meal, and then she could do it at a more appropriate time. But it didn't work out that way. Shortly after we started the meal, Josh got candid. Why did you move all your stuff into the guest room, Dad? Is there something going on between you two? Both sons watched our faces but never once swiped their forks. Marcy had no idea I'd moved my stuff. Let your mom explain it to you. Marcy was nervous. Somehow I didn't think she could do it, and I turned out to be right. Your father and I decided it would be a good idea if we spent some time apart. It's temporary, and you boys have nothing to worry about. I put my fork down on my plate and looked at my wife. I'm sorry, Marcy, but it's not enough. Either you tell them the truth or I will. She was flustered. By this point, she still wasn't sure what I knew, and she definitely didn't want to spill the beans in front of her kids. I'm sorry, John, but that's the best I can do. Josh and Jordan set their forks aside and looked at us. The longer I waited, the more annoyed I became. Yesterday afternoon, your mother spent four hours doing it with her lover at the Executive Suite Hotel in King of Prussia. There was silence at the table. Marcy realized I knew everything. She was staring at her plate, not wanting to meet the eyes of either of us. She didn't even seem to be breathing. 
The boys got up and walked out the front door together. That was cruel, John. You didn't have to do that. I gave you a choice and you didn't make it. After what you did to me, it wasn't cruel. I'll move out of the guest room as soon as I find an apartment. Marcy finally cried, running upstairs. I cleaned up the dishes from dinner. No one had eaten anything, so everything went into the trash can. I was loading the dishes into the dishwasher when she came downstairs with a small bag. She stopped before she walked through the door. Where are you going to be? I'm staying with Janice. I watched her get in the car and drive to her sister's house. By the time the boys got home, it was past midnight. I was sitting in the living room with my fifth mug of beer. They looked at me and left upstairs without saying a word. The next morning, I was still lying on the couch when I heard the doorbell ring. Without thinking long, I found that Ray and Carl had brought coffee and danishes. Carl set the coffee and danish on the kitchen table. We sat in silence for a few moments, and then Carl melted the ice. Bradley is still in jail. He's waiting for his parents to bail him out. Carla has been released from the hospital, and she and her daughter have moved in with her parents. We don't know if she will press charges or not. It's a shame that a grown man has to call his parents to get bail money. How are you guys doing? How are things going on the home front? Carl spoke first. When I got home today, there was a message on the answering machine. Jenny called and left a message for Betsy that I knew all about it. I checked the house and half of her clothes were gone along with her personal belongings. I don't know where she is. Thank goodness the girls are off to school. This is all I have. Ray didn't feel like talking at all, but he felt obligated. Jenny left me a note saying she was going to visit her parents in Frackville this weekend. She said she'd call me when she got there. But there was no call. Well, I'm in the same boat. Marcy and I had a talk last night, and partly in front of the boys. Instead of talking things over, she packed a bag and left for her sisters. I don't know when I'll hear from her. John, how did they know we were in the loop? Carl was concerned that things were getting out of hand. My guess is that Bradley met with Carla as soon as he got home, and she managed to call Jenny before things went south. I know Jenny called Marcy around dinner time. That's probably when she left a message for Betsy, too. What about the guys? Does anyone know anything about what's going on with the assholes who set this whole thing up? Ray seemed a little flustered by the situation. We spent the next few hours talking about our problems. Josh and Jordan came down for breakfast and listened to the conversations, but didn't say anything. I decided not to hide anything from them. After Carl and Ray left, the boys and I had a heart-to-heart -heart talk. They wanted to stay in the house until they finished school. Both of them would rather spend that time with me than their mother. I didn't do anything to tarnish her name or image. I didn't try to influence them in any way. It didn't really matter. The boys and I spent Sunday doing yard work. Mowing, trimming, and pruning, which always seemed to be put off for later. We tried our best to kill time. Nothing was said all day about the family situation. Marcy didn't call. Bradley called to let me know he was out on bail. Carla had a restraining order against him. It seemed funny that four guys who had done nothing wrong were being forced to pay for the shit their wives had done. Something was wrong with the whole scene. Things didn't improve the next day. I was thankful that Josh and Jordan were old enough to take care of themselves. Josh was leaving for college in three months, and Jordan was leaving the following year. Bradley showed up at the house before I left for work. We went to IHOP together to have breakfast and break the news to each other. Carla agreed to drop the charges against Bradley if he would agree to a no-fault divorce. From his perspective, it wasn't difficult. He was going to start the paperwork as soon as we finished eating. I was going to have to take some action because in my mind, the marriage was over. We each had our own issues to deal with, but Bradley and I decided that the four of us getting together would be a good idea. I agreed to buy a pizza if they brought beer. Work was hard for me. Joyce, my faithful secretary, tried to find out why I hadn't come back to work on Friday afternoon. She gave up when she saw I wasn't responding. The big surprise came just before noon. Mr. Terrell, my name is Nelson Noyce. I'm with the state's attorney's office. He was fat and suffered from rosacea. Beads of sweat were visible between his thinning hair and on his forehead. I decided not to shake his hand. What can I do for you? This is a cease and desist order served in the name of the state. You are hereby ordered to cease all inquiries into the personal life of State Assemblyman Alan Hoffman. 
Any further intrusion will result in criminal prosecution by the state. He handed me a manila folder that apparently held some legal documents. I'm sorry, Mr. Noyes, but I was under the impression that Assemblyman Hoffman is a public figure and therefore open to this kind of investigation. Are you a lawyer, Mr. Terrell? No. Then I suggest you read the order and don't make a fuss. At these words, a sarcastic smile appeared on his face. I leaned back in my chair and smiled back at him. Walking out of the office, he suddenly looked a little unsure of himself. I took the rest of the day off. There were four major television stations in the Philadelphia area that served the tri-state area. There were three other smaller stations in the surrounding cities. The drive to Philadelphia took an hour. Three of the four stations were more than happy to hear about the cease and desist order, and two of them even recorded an interview with me. I didn't procrastinate, and unfortunately I had to paint my wife with the same brush I used to paint Hoffman. The TV station, which had no interest in the information, was extremely liberal and didn't want to alarm the Democratic Party chieftains. I stopped at three smaller stations on the way home, but they had already gotten the information from the wire service. Just as I was pulling up to my house, I heard the assemblyman's affair being discussed on a radio talk show. I didn't make any more inquiries about Alan Hoffman's personal life, but told everyone what I already knew. He chose to play the game and I just agreed to play it. Any legal action the state or assemblyman decides to take will only make things worse. Marcy came home in my absence and removed all of her clothes and personal belongings. She made her intentions clear. She left a note explaining that she would be staying with her sister indefinitely. I had no choice but to stay in the house with the boys, which suited me just fine. Tomorrow would be a good day to go to the bank if it wasn't too late. I also needed to meet with my lawyer. Josh and Jordan came home from school and immediately went somewhere. Things were friendly between us, but they preferred the company of their friends. Shortly after 5 o'clock, I got a frantic phone call from Marcy. She still hadn't said what she wanted and seemed content to rant about how mean I was for airing our dirty laundry like that. I tried to explain what her boyfriend had done to provoke the conflict, but she didn't want to hear any of it. Apparently, it didn't matter how the circumstances turned out, it was all my fault. It was starting to get fun. Soon, Carl, Bradley, and Ray showed up. I ordered pizza and we settled in for a long evening. Richard Tolliver had disappeared, taking with him last month's deposits from Superlens Optical. They totaled over $60,000. Since he was the manager and not the owner, the money did not belong to him. Carl was fairly certain that Betsy was with him. Carl canceled all of his credit cards, but not before she used one of them at a motel in Indiana. He notified the authorities about the card's use. Driving past the house at 321 David Drive, Bradley found it empty and stopped by the body shop where Steve Springer worked. Bradley was sure Springer would get his last paycheck and leave a forwarding address. He told them he was Steve's landlord and wanted to send him a rent check. They gladly gave him the address. Once the divorce papers were ready, Bradley made the trip to Nitro, West Virginia. We all wished him luck. Ray grinned stupidly as he told us about the disappearance of Jenny's Volvo. It was parked in front of her parents' house in Frackville. The car was insured, of course, but the payout exceeded the current appraised value. Jenny still hadn't called him, and no one had reported the car missing. He promised us that Owen Zimmer would hear from him soon. I have no idea what he did with the car. After I explained everything about the Alan Hoffman television expose, we discussed how we could help each other. We decided to call it a day when we ran out of beer. No sooner had I gotten the house in order than the boys came home. They had been getting a lot of complaints about their mother and were not happy. I had no idea how I could help them. The next morning, I never went to work. Joyce called me on my cell phone before I arrived. There were several officials and police officers waiting for me at the office. She told them that I would be in Baltimore for the rest of the day. She also notified Human Resources that I was taking a sick leave. I spent the rest of the morning with my attorney. I spent most of the afternoon at the bank. If I was sought out by the state, I wasn't too successful. Around 3 o'clock, I got a phone call I was in no way expecting. Jack Terrell? This is Alice Hoffman. Actually, it's John, but I'm available to answer any question. How can I help you? Meet me at Luciano's at the bar 5 o'clock. I'll recognize you. Any particular reason? I think we can be of use to each other. No more questions. I'll see you at 5. This was completely unexpected. I'd seen pictures of Alice Hoffman on the news and in the papers. She was a force behind her wimpy husband. 
She came from money and knew how to use it. I had a strange feeling that this time Alan had overstepped his bounds. Alice Hoffman always had perfect hair and makeup. She always wore the best clothes. The term high maintenance was coined just for her. Marcy probably wanted to take her place, but Alan Hoffman didn't have the money and Alice did. I stopped by the house to get a clean shirt and tie, but I couldn't get in. There were two official cars parked in front of the house. She would have to meet me sweaty and dirty. I had no trouble finding Alice Hoffman at the restaurant. A big burly man in a dark suit met me at the door and escorted me to a secluded corner booth. Do you mind if I call you Jack? Not at all. My father always calls me Jack, but he's the only one. The light was dim, but I could make out that her hair was blonde with silver flecks in it. They weren't dyed. She was in her 40s, but she was well on her feet. Her outfit was simple, a white blouse and a beige skirt. On a silver chain hung a crystal heart that seemed to tie the whole picture together. I wanted to thank you for the wonderful job you did in embarrassing my husband. I couldn't have done a better job myself, even though I wanted to. However, I am sorry you had to pay such a price. It must be terrible for a loving husband to learn something like that. It was not my intention to humiliate you or your husband. I would have been content to keep it all a secret. I'm afraid your husband pulled the wrong string. I don't respond well to threats. I understand. I'm not humiliated or embarrassed, Jack. On the contrary, I'm relieved. I was getting ready to dump the creep, but I couldn't do it without looking vindictive or grumpy. You solved that problem for me. Since you're already committed, I was hoping we could help each other. You want me to look like the bad guy so you can get a divorce? Exactly. Will you be able to handle that? How will you help me with this operation? I have videotapes, three of them to be exact, of your wife and my husband. They are of very high quality. I would be happy to provide you with copies to use in your divorce if you promise to make them public in some way. That would be disgusting to my wife. I don't mind messing with your husband, but I would have a hard time doing something like that to my wife, no matter what she did. Perhaps you'll change your mind after you watch them. The conversation between Alan and your wife on the last tape is not a pleasant one. Some of the comments are hurtful. I found it hard to believe that a woman could be married to a man for 20 years and think so poorly of him. They didn't treat me any better. I would prefer that you give some thought to my feelings when you decide to release the records. After all, it's your choice. I trust you to be fair. Now I'm starting to feel bad. Should we get something to drink? Alice waved her hand, and a waiter appeared out of nowhere. We sat in silence for a few minutes until the drinks arrived. I was absorbed in my own thoughts, and she waited nervously for my answer. I gingerly squeezed a lime slice into my gin and tonic. Without the lime, it's just a soda drink. I thought about what she said was on the tape. Okay. I'll do it. It was worth it to see her eyes light up. Alan Hoffman was a jerk, not realizing what he had right at home. He was a stupid, stupid man who just threw his life away. Jack, I'll make sure you're not bothered by any more state or local police services. My husband may hold the position, but he doesn't have anywhere near the power he thinks he does. She handed me three CDs across the table. Make copies of these and edit them if you need to. The third one also has some phone conversations on it. I hope this will be an exciting project for you. Feel free to use the internet if you think it will help. I know you have two sons, so don't do anything to embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you, am I? I'm not in any of the videos. My feelings might be hurt, but I won't be embarrassed. I had a feeling our meeting was coming to an end. Will I see you again, Mrs. Hoffman? Do you feel it's necessary or do you just feel like doing it? I'm sorry. I said it out of place. It didn't come out the way I wanted it to. Oh, now my feelings are hurt. We both smiled. I put the disc in my pocket and got up to leave. Friday, 7 o'clock at this table. We're going to eat this time. Do you mind? I smiled and nodded. For some reason, I felt guilty, but I liked it. When I got home, the black cars were gone. Josh and Jordan had prepared some sort of diner for us. Everything was what they liked and not very balanced, but I appreciated their efforts. Later, we watched a pay-per-view movie. I stayed up all night editing the videos and phone conversations Alice Hoffman gave me. The three videos were mostly boring, with a few flecks of good. At the end of the last tape, 
Alan was on the phone with his friend after Marcy left. It was a short conversation, and only one side was recorded. But it was significant enough that I made a separate copy to play it back for Marcy if the situation called for it. I had to go back to work the next day, and I was tired from being up most of the night. I thanked Joyce for covering for me by giving her a bouquet of daisies, her favorite. By now, she knew what was going on, as did everyone else in the building. I couldn't figure out if I was considered a hero or a lowlife. One of the television stations from Philadelphia agreed to come to me about the video. This saved me the trip in the second half of the day. The TV reporter who took the edited disc was very happy to receive it. He was very careful to explain that almost all of it could not be shown on public television. Of course, I understood it all. I asked in passing if the rest of it might not happen to be elsewhere. He smiled to show that he understood what I meant, but didn't say so. Since he seemed receptive, I gave him a second disc that had the images on it. He shook my hand and promised me it would be done the way I wanted it done. Josh and Jordan had high enough SAT scores to get into college without a problem. Jordan, not knowing what to do good old dad, applied for early admission based on his scores. All he had to do was get a high school diploma instead of another year of high school. I wasn't thrilled with the idea, but he got it all set up and felt confident. So now they will both be going to Pennsylvania State University at the same time. I took out a second mortgage on the house and prepaid tuition for both of them for four years. This took all of our savings and all of the equity that Marcy and I had in the house. I was now ready to determine the terms of the divorce. My wife would not be happy. I was staying late at work. Joyce was doing a great job covering for me, but it couldn't go on forever. Marcy called to complain about credit cards that no longer worked. I took the opportunity to tell her that she would have to start using her prepaid cell phone because I would cancel her regular phone that same day. In the evening, I told the boys that disturbing videos of their mother might appear on the internet. They weren't thrilled, but said I supported them in what needed to be done. The next morning, Marcy waited outside for Josh and Jordan to leave for school and then knocked on the door. She sat down at the kitchen table and I handed her a cup of coffee. John, can we stop this? Things are getting out of control. I'm afraid to watch TV or even leave the house. I've heard rumors of pictures being posted on several websites. It's not fair, John. I know what I did was wrong, but I was careful and cautious so you wouldn't be embarrassed or hurt. Your attempt at being cautious didn't go too well, did it? Do you have any idea how much embarrassment you've caused your sons? It wasn't me, it was you. When you made it all public, you ruined it. I think it would have been a good idea to let it go. I told you before that I would have been very happy to do so, but when your lover decided to threaten me, I was forced to change my mind. What made you get involved with such a despicable character in the first place? He wasn't despicable. He was understanding and caring. You took me for granted. He valued me. He flattered me and made me feel good about myself. My self-esteem always remained high for days after interacting with him. He was not despicable. I hated hearing my wife make excuses for her infidelity. The saddest part was that she was completely wrong about his feelings for her. I knew it would be cruel, but I felt it was time to end her life in a fantasy world. I pulled a small digital record player out of my pocket and placed it on the table. This is the phone call Alan Hoffman made to his friend the last time you two were together. I'm sorry, but under the circumstances, I feel obligated to play it back for you. I think it's unfair to blame me for what you did. For 20 years, I treated you with decency and respect, and you dropped everything for this guy. I hit the play button and watched her face as Alan Hoffman began to speak. It was a one-sided conversation. Hey, Greg. Sorry I'm a little late. As always, terrific. Great way to brighten up a cloudy day. I don't think so, mate. I'd never go out in public with her. Behind closed doors with the lights dimmed, she's a bombshell, but it doesn't go any further than that. The only reason I still go out with her is because she has a great head. I know, but her face looks like someone grated it on a cheese grater. Hell, I think she applies her makeup with a brush. That's why I always try to dim the lights. I don't know if she's up for a threesome, but I can suggest it next time we meet. No, that's okay. I'll be there in about 20 minutes. Marcy sat silently, looking straight ahead. She wasn't looking at anything, just staring. Her eyes felt like they were misting up. I knew this tape was hurting her. All the years we'd been married, I'd tried not to bring up the subject of her teenage acne, scars, and marks. I could never hurt her like that. 
she focused her gaze on me. I didn't need to hear that. What the hell did you think you were going to accomplish by playing that tape? At least I thought I could come out of this whole fiasco with fond memories, and now you've even ruined that. It was amazing. Alan Hoffman, my wife's lover, reveals his true feelings for her, and she takes offense at me. In 20 years, I've never once admonished you or anyone else about your complexion, and you still choose to side with this weasel. I put the recorder in my pocket and got up to leave. When I got to work, I called my lawyer and told him to deliver the divorce papers as soon as he had a chance. We decided to use infidelity as the reason rather than something milder. Carl called and made an appointment to meet for lunch. Joyce seemed to be a little tipsy because she found two websites with videos of my wife and Assemblyman Hoffman. I was sure they wouldn't last long because they didn't meet privacy requirements, but by the time they were taken down, the damage would be done. According to a local TV station, Alan Hoffman was on an unscheduled vacation in the Bahamas. There was no statement to the press. Lunch with Carl was interesting. Betsy and Tolliver were picked up in Kentucky near Fort Campbell. Some local cop was doing a random check of out-of-state license plates and ran them just for practice. As luck would have it, Tolliver's license plate was the winning number. Carl had no idea what was going to happen next, but seemed to be enjoying the situation at the moment. They had called him to verify her identity, but there was no indication that any other action was required on his part. Bradley borrowed a car somewhere and headed to Nitro, West Virginia. We didn't know what he was going to do, nor did we want to know. Good luck to him. Neither Carl nor I saw or heard from Ray for several days. The rest of the day passed quietly and without incident. Later, a realtor friend of mine stopped by to take down an ad for a house for sale. Since the boys were getting ready to hit the road and I was alone, I didn't need him. I was just hoping that after paying the realtor and closing costs, there would be enough money left over that I wouldn't have to take anything out of my pocket. There was some interesting news on TV that night. It seems that a $300,000 mobile home had burned to the ground in a parking lot at the Green Dragon Market. The mobile home belonged to Owen Zimmer, a businessman from Lancaster. Arson was suspected. I laughed to myself as I pulled a beer out of the refrigerator. It was nice to see that Ray wasn't going to take any of this shit personally. There was a Steven Seagal marathon that night. Hell, there was a Steven Seagal marathon every night. I checked to make sure I had enough beer. I had no idea where my sons were. Friday was a slow day at work, which I appreciated. Marcy called after lunch to inquire about the for sale sign in the front yard. I told her that she could take any furniture she wanted out of the house and that we would split the profit 50-50. She didn't protest the sale of the house. I think at that point she realized there was no turning back. She had no idea that Jordan would get early admission to college. From this information, I guessed that the boys were not talking to their mother. She called again in the afternoon when she got the divorce papers. I told her we could talk the next day. It seemed she was unhappy with the reason given in the papers. That evening, I looked forward to dinner. Alice Hoffman was sitting in the same seat as the last time I had seen her. This time, however, she looked radiant. As usual, her hair and makeup were flawless. The dress she was wearing was appropriate for the occasion and suited her very well. As I approached the table, I suddenly realized I was staring at her. I didn't notice your assistant when I walked in. His daughter has a piano recital tonight, so I gave him the day off. You may have to give me a ride home later, so watch out for the drinks. For some reason, it sounded like an invitation, which was awkward since the lady barely knew me. I think a little wine wouldn't hurt, John. Do you have any preference? I'm no wine connoisseur, but a rosé, Portuguese if they have it, would suit me. How utilitarian. This could turn out to be a cheap date for me. A few minutes later, we were already sharing a cold bottle of Lancers. I sipped some and smiled. Since this is a date, as you said, I'm afraid I'll feel obligated to foot the bill. Please don't order the lobster. The conversation remained light and pleasant for most of the evening. At one point, Alice mentioned that it would make her divorce easier if she could get some sort of statement from Marcy confirming that she had cheated. I promised to talk to her about it. We didn't order another bottle of wine, but switched to coffee. Alice didn't order the lobster, and I ended up paying for the evening. I drove her home and walked her to the door. She didn't invite me in, but I gave her a quick kiss on the cheek. She didn't protest. It ended beautifully, just as it had begun. I enjoyed myself in her company. On the way home, I tried to think of ways to see her again. 
The guys and I were just finishing breakfast when Marcy showed up. Josh and Jordan tried to be polite to their mother, but they weren't very good at it. They both went outside and within minutes, the lawnmower was already breaking the morning silence. What can I do for you, Marcy? I saw no reason to exchange pleasantries, so I got right to the point. These are the terms of the divorce. I was wondering if I could convince you to change them to something less explicit. You don't like the term infidelity? I know it's completely justified and you have every right to use it, but I'd feel better if you softened it a bit. It didn't make sense since the media was putting it out there. I'll offer you a deal. If you give a statement to Alice Hoffman's lawyer confirming an affair with her husband, I'll change it to whatever you want. How did you get involved in the Alice Hoffman divorce case? Why is it so important to you? My relationship with Alice was very casual and strictly professional, but I still felt a little guilty trying to explain it to Marcy. After what she had done, my indecision made no sense, but apparently I still felt married and obligated to be faithful. Now I realized that was a stupid trait to hold on to. Alice Hoffman contacted me to see if I could help her gather information that would help her in her divorce. She was the one who gave me the videotapes of you and Alan. At the mention of the videotapes, tears came to Marcy's eyes. She didn't cry completely, just sort of whimpered. I held out a paper napkin for her to wipe her face. Janice and I watched some of it online. It was horrible. They didn't even have the decency to block my face. Thank God they didn't give my name or where we live. How do you think I felt? I know it sounds cold, but I didn't think about how any of this would affect you or the boys. It wasn't until I found out about the tapes that I became concerned. I suppose that suggests you're not sorry for what you did, but for getting caught. I hate to say it, but I guess that's the way it is. There's no way I can undo what I did, and I can never do it again. I filled her cup with coffee and she wiped her face again. John, I'm sorry about what I did in the videos. I'm sorry you saw them. I don't understand why you did things to him that you didn't do to me. It's like you loved him more than you loved me. The tears were already starting to come. I didn't want to upset her like that, but I felt like she had steered the conversation in that direction on her own. Surprisingly, I didn't feel guilty for hurting her. He was rich and powerful, and I felt like I wanted to do anything to please him. I didn't love him, but I wanted to be with him. I know I'm not beautiful or statuesque, so I thought I could make him happy by giving him a gift in the form of me. I was desperate, so I did things to him that I had never done before. I wish I could fix things. I put my cup in the sink. I didn't feel like drinking coffee anymore. I guess I just didn't want to drink any more coffee with Marcy. I grabbed Alice Hoffman's attorney's business card from the refrigerator and handed it to her. She took the card and walked out the door. Actually, Marcy, what you said on the tape hurt me more than anything you two did together. You made remarks about me and our relationship that will forever be etched in my memory. Nothing seemed to escape your verbal attacks. You weren't happy with my looks, my job, my ability to provide for you or our lives. It seems that in your eyes, I couldn't do anything right. Divorce will be such a relief to you. You'll finally be rid of your loser husband. John, please, it wasn't like that. I'm sorry, Marcy. Goodbye. She stood on the porch, still crying, as I closed the door and turned away. As her car pulled out of the driveway, the lawnmower stopped. Josh and Jordan walked into the house and each grabbed a glass of cold Coke. Are you going to break the news to us, or are we still going to be treated like mushrooms? Josh tried to be nice, but also get his point across. Your mom wasn't happy that I got a divorce for adultery. She asked if I could change it to something so she wouldn't look like a slut. I hope you didn't agree. She's your mother, Josh. Have some compassion. They both looked at me, a little disappointed. They went back out into the yard, and a few minutes later, the lawnmower was back on. Since Jordan had gotten his high school diploma, he didn't have to go to school anymore. Josh still had to go, but only to accumulate attendance days. He had already completed all the requirements for matriculation. Jordan used this time to earn some money working for a local landscaper. They enjoyed teasing each other. Josh could see the hot girls at school and Jordan could make money. Things were slowly starting to get better. Anyway, Owen Zimmer's wife found out why his mobile home burned down. Turns out Owen was a salesman who worked at a Volvo dealership and happened to be married to the owner's daughter. 
He didn't own anything, but she did. The wheels didn't start turning immediately after his wife received a mysterious package in the mail. Soon, Owen would find himself on the street, without a job and without a wife. Jenny was still living with her parents. Ray had made no attempt to contact her since he filed for divorce. Bradley returned from West Virginia with a satisfied smile on his face. He made sure Carla got a copy of the newspaper article describing the injuries Steve Springer had sustained in an unprovoked attack over the weekend. Mr. Springer told police that three men jumped him for no reason as he was leaving his home. It was actually one angry husband with a baseball bat. Carla ended up canceling the divorce petition, but Bradley promised nothing one way or the other. Carl filed Betsy's divorce papers while she was in jail in Clarksville. He deposited everything and moved to Pensacola. I never found out what happened to Betsy. After Carl left, I didn't care. I had lunch with Alice a few times a week and usually had dinner in the evening, once on the weekend. There was nothing romantic about it, just good company. After a while, we stopped mentioning the cheating and impending divorce. We did, however, talk about Alan, mostly because he hadn't returned from the Bahamas or wherever he'd been. It seems he had a special deal with some shady businessmen for the franchise of the state's DMV business. Large sums of money were changing hands, and a lot of people wanted to talk to Mr. Hoffman. Alice wanted to meet Josh and Jordan, but I was delaying the moment. There was too great a chance that someone would turn a beautiful relationship into something inappropriate. All of my clubmates seemed to have solved their marital problems with some form of satisfaction. I, on the other hand, felt mine was still in limbo. But things changed in ways I never imagined. Jordan got permission to take classes during the summer session for himself and Josh. With my permission, Josh was able to get his diploma without taking a year of classes. He will miss the graduation ceremonies, but both boys will be able to go to college early. Looks like Jordan was becoming quite the negotiator. I took time off work to help move them both to campus. I was alone now. I didn't remember leaving the house lights on when I left, and I didn't expect to find a heavy-set man in my living room. He held a Foster's in one hand and my first copy of The Big Kill in the other. Somehow I wasn't scared. The beer was from my refrigerator and the book was from my library. He looked confident and calm as he acknowledged my presence. Good evening, Mr. Terrell. I hope you don't mind that I relaxed a bit while I waited for your return. I trust your boys have settled in nicely. I've always enjoyed reading Mickey Spillane. His first five books were the best, don't you think? My uninvited guest was dressed in a blue blazer and gray turtleneck. He looked like he belonged at the country club, not in my living room. He wore a pair of bifocal glasses on the bridge of his nose. Without answering, I left the room and got myself a beer. When I returned, he had put his book on the side table. I sat down across from him and tasted my long neck. He smiled and seemed very relaxed. My name is Elwood Kincaid. Alice Hoffman is my only daughter. She needs help right now, and as far as I can tell, you are the only one who can help her. Now I knew what real money looked like. Someone who likes Mike Hammer and Australian beer can't be all bad. I'm all ears, Mr. Kincaid. Please continue. There are several different groups of people looking for my daughter's husband. Unfortunately, some of them are not very nice. I had to move Alice to a safe place, and I need someone to watch over her. Someone I can trust. I thought she had someone on staff to take care of that. Not anymore. I'm not going to explain. When I say look after her, I don't mean she needs to be physically protected. She needs companionship and comfort more. From what she's told me, you're the best person for the job. Elwood Kincaid smiled as he explained the situation. I don't know if I felt awkward or at ease while doing so. What exactly do you mean by that? I just need you to hold her hand for a week or two. He set the empty bottle on the side table, placing it carefully on a lined napkin. Where is she now? Upstate New York. I have a small house on a remote stretch of the Chazy River. If she were any farther north, she'd end up in Canada. I have a job I have to go to. You have two weeks paid vacation starting today. Everything is already taken care of. Could you explain again why you chose me? Mr. Kincaid seemed reluctant to answer my question. After fidgeting in his seat for a bit, he finally seemed ready for me. I made a big mistake a few years ago when I literally forced Alice to marry Alan Hoffman. I thought he was a bright, up-and-coming political force and thought he would be the perfect husband for my daughter. She didn't like him and at first rejected my proposal. Unfortunately, I kept nagging her until she gave in. 
I ruined her life and I don't want that to happen again. What makes you think I'm any better? She chose you. I'm in no position to argue with her. I picked up two empty bottles of beer and headed for the kitchen. I don't need any more, John. I've already had two. Three beers and I'm peeing the bed. I returned with a new bottle of beer in my hand. How do I find this place? He reached into his pocket and handed me a small handheld GPS unit. The coordinates are already programmed into it. You won't need it until you're north of Plattsburgh. I have a map for you too, just in case. I sat staring at the GPS as Elwood Kincaid got up to leave. If you'd like, you can take the book with you. Thanks, but I've already read it three times. How soon can you leave? I'll be out of here before dawn. I finished my beer as he headed out the door. I still didn't see where he'd parked his car. I needed a shower and a good night's sleep. I was almost to Binghamton when my cell phone buzzed. John, it's Janice. Where are you? I'm having trouble getting through. I'm on a little trip. What can I do for you? Marcy is missing. I haven't seen or heard from her since yesterday morning. I was hoping you might know something. I'm sorry, Janice. I was at the State College all day yesterday with the guys. I have no idea where she might be. She hasn't called in a while. John, I don't know what to do. Can you come over to our house? I don't think so. I'm in New York State right now and heading for Lake Champlain. I'll probably be here at least a week, maybe longer. Have you notified the police? Yes. They'll be here soon. I was just hoping you'd be here to talk to them. I don't have any thoughts that would help. You've been closer to Marcy the last few weeks, so you probably know better than I do where she is and what she's doing. Don't get me wrong, I care about what happened to her, but I'm not in a position to be of much help. I'll call you after the police leave. Maybe I'll give them your cell phone number. Is that okay with you? No problem. Thanks for the call. I'm sorry I can't be of more help. I spent the next few hours reminiscing about my and Marcy's life together. For some reason, I dwelled on the times I doubted her fidelity. It was never anything substantial. I remembered moments when I experienced bouts of jealousy, when she talked at length with men she knew at parties or other events. I wondered about some of the little trips she had taken with her girlfriends over the years. Given recent events, I now felt that she might have had other affairs that I was too innocent to find out about at the time. I chastised myself for being too naive and gullible. Perhaps if I had been more careful and affectionate, none of this would have happened. A cup of hot coffee from Mickey D's brought me back to my senses. I didn't cheat, she did. Leave it here. North of Saratoga Springs, the phone rang a few times, but the reception was too bad to hold a conversation. I decided not to bother with it and just drove on. The cabin that Elwood Kincaid directed me to was not near Chasey, but further west. The GPS was a big help. Without it, I would not have found the place. The west branch of the Chasey River was solid rock and white water. Driving along it was very beautiful against the backdrop of the setting sun. In my imagination, I could see a native rainbow under every rock. I was hoping to find fishing gear at my destination. Naturally, I missed the turn. The GPS immediately informed me of my mistake. It was at least a quarter mile down a paved gravel road before I saw the place. It was a stone cabin with a wide, full-width front porch. Given the abundance of rock in the area, it was understandable why they chose stone rather than logs. The cabin stood on a small mound about a hundred feet from the river. When I opened the car door, the first thing I noticed was the sound of running water. The second was Alice standing in the doorway of the cabin, illuminated by the light from the room behind her. I imagined she was waiting for the sound of a car on the gravel or the light of headlights. I was flattered that she was anxious to see me. I was glad to see her. She waited on the porch like a little girl while I dropped off my bags. I had to drop them when she threw herself around my neck and hugged me. It would have been the perfect time for a real kiss, but we both pulled away, slightly embarrassed before it happened. She had hot chili on the stove and cold beer in the fridge. It was the perfect ending to a long day. Alice and I chatted for a few hours. I was still trying not to be too explicit. I liked Alice, but we were both married, and I was a little inexperienced with romance. The guest room was cozy, but the master bedroom would be nicer. Tomorrow I would have to force myself to be a little braver. I woke up to the smell of sausages and cookies. 
Alice waited until my mustachioed face showed itself to her before she started on the scrambled eggs. She was cheerful and alert. It turned out that she buys most of her clothes at L.L. Bean. It fit her much better than the fancy clothes she wore in town. She was proud of the quince jelly because she had made it herself. She had to admit it was delicious. When the first pot of coffee ran out, I used that as an excuse to go take a shower and shave. I felt comfortable enough to talk to her all morning. The rest of the morning was spent walking around the grounds. There were several hundred acres here, quite secluded. The river served as the boundary on one side and the main road on the other. I had never seen so many rocks in my life. It seemed like a million years ago a glacier had stopped here to rest. After lunch, Alice introduced me to a small room full of fishing equipment. Her eyes lit up when she saw my excitement. Two weeks would not be enough. I tried unsuccessfully several times to reach Janice on her cell phone. The cabin had electricity, but no phone. Alice said that's what her father wanted. Who could argue with that logic? While Alice did minor household chores, I took inventory and explored the equipment room. I didn't have a New York fishing license, but Elwood had been kind enough to leave my fishing vest with my license. I didn't believe the fish and game warden would be interested in checking this stretch of private water, but it couldn't hurt to put it on. For my evening project, I chose an old bamboo rod with weathered eyes. The rod was at least 50 years old. Most of the glass eyes were cracked or missing. It was perfect for what I wanted. An old Mitchell spinning reel I discovered was in need of a good cleaning and lubrication. In the corner lay a broken spinning rod with matching eyelets. I was looking forward to tomorrow. The spaghetti dinner that Alice made that night was delicious. The only thing missing was fresh Italian bread. I made up for the lack of bread with a second mug of beer. Even though it was summer, we decided to build a fire. It was cool enough that we didn't feel uncomfortable, and I have to admit it was romantic. It only took a few hours to attach the spinning rod to my bamboo fly rod. Since I was ready for the next day, I spent the rest of the evening with Alice in front of the fireplace. She had an antique popcorn popper that we had fun trying to use. I think we burned more than half of it, but we had a lot of fun. The bonfire was starting to finish when Alice looked at me. You're not going to make me sleep alone again, are you? Needless to say, I missed an early morning fishing trip. By the time we crawled out of bed, it was too late for breakfast. We had scrambled eggs or brunch for lunch. I was amazed that we were as compatible in bed as we were at the dinner table. Alice insisted that I go fishing after lunch. She claimed she needed to rest. It was good to know that Alan had taught Alice the same sleeping tricks that Marcy had learned. I hate to admit it, but I'm an illegal fisherman. I spent 20 minutes collecting maggots from the bottom of the creeks. As bait, they were irresistible to trout. According to the state, it was illegal to fish for them. In less than an hour, I had four beauties. That night, we had fresh trout and home fries for dinner. Alice also brought a Mateus rose that she had brought especially for the occasion. Things couldn't have been better than they are now. I had completely forgotten about my missing wife. After five days of heavenly bliss, I decided it was time to make a little trip to Plattsburgh. We ate a few hamburgers and fries. We got a cell phone signal, and I was able to contact Janice. Marcy was currently visiting with the FBI. Janice didn't know anything else. And I didn't care. I called the attorney and found out that the divorce was on schedule and no problems were anticipated. The real estate agent was happy to tell me that we had an offer on the house but was unhappy that it was impossible to get consent signatures. I agreed to come back the next day to sign the papers, but had no idea how they would get Marcy's signature. The next morning, I was about to drive back to Pennsylvania when Alice told me that it wasn't necessary. We drove to the Plattsburgh airport where a private jet was waiting for us. I had no idea how she had arranged the plane, and I didn't even know it would be there. Two hours later, we were home. It must be nice to have a rich daddy. I took care of a few small chores while Alice chatted with her dad. Three hours later, we were on our way back to the house, or should I say cabin. Alice had bought a few more bottles of wine and a case of Foster's. She also bought some new underwear, though I don't know why. It felt good to be back at the lodge. It felt like I belonged there. Two weeks later, we had a visit from Elwood Kincaid. Somehow he'd managed to get my final divorce decree. I was now a free man. He also had the death certificate for Alan Hoffman who had apparently drowned in the shallows off Montego Bay. No one had any idea what he was doing there or how he got there. The FBI no longer needed Marcy. She was living with Janice again. Mr. Kincaid had ordered all the furniture and belongings from the house to be put into storage. I don't know if Marcy got any of it. 
If I wanted to come back, my old job would be open to me. I was looking forward to winter on the west branch of the Chazy River. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.